So let's dive deep for the next few minutes into the mitochondria. These are the powerhouses in the cell. This is where we make our energy. And don't think of them as just single powerhouses. There are hundreds, if not thousands, in every cell. And remember, everyone is going to have its own DNA structure and its own ability to regenerate. So in addition to supplying cellular energy, mitochondria involved in such tasks as cell signaling, uh, differentiation cell death, you know, as apoptosis. Um, so what we've got is different mitochondrial compartments. When we look in there, it's a little, little bit like a, uh, a packaging material. So on the outside here, we've got our outer membrane. Remember what membranes are made of in the body? They're made of phospholipids, aren't they? In other words, oils, both saturates and unsaturates in there, um, here. And then this is the inner mitochondrial membrane, is this like this corrugations. And these corrugations are called Christi. Okay? And what, of course, that does is it enlarges massively the surface area. That's why it's there. And so the inner part of the mitochondria, which is where all the oxidative, all, where all the Krebs cycles occur, is in the matrix. So this is called the matrix. So the mitochondrial compartments include the outer membrane, the inner membrane, the Christi, and the, and the matrix there. Um, so the outer and the inner membranes are composed of phospholipids, and the two membranes have different properties, and in between the two is the space. The inner membrane uh, performs the redox reactions, in other words, the ability to take the oxidized oxidative phosphorylation and the making of ATP. Uh, it is, this membrane has a high protein to phospholipid ratio, which is about one protein to 15 phospholipids. So in other words, it's largely fats. And if it's largely oils or fats, remember that at least 50% of that usually is going to be unsaturates, okay? <laughs> but this membrane is a little different from a lot of other uh, phospholipids in the body. It contains a specialized phospholipid called cardiolipin. Cardiolipin. Now, cardio means heart, doesn't it? Okay? And this is called cardiolipin because that's where it was first extracted from, the heart of tissue. And something, as we'll see, like 70% of the dry weight of heart tissue is cardiolipin. And because cardiac muscle has a lot of mitochondria, up to 2,000 mitochondria per, uh, per cell, per muscle cell in the mitochondria, which is small fry compared with the neurons. You have 5,000, okay? But cardiolipin is first extracted from the heart tissue. Therefore, one of the best sources of cardiolipin is actually heart, okay? That's why in Mexico and other places, traditionally, years ago, the Aztecs used to rip out the heart and eat it. So again, good idea for barbecue in the summer. Okay, not just liver, but we'll have heart now as well. Okay. The dog will be deadly jealous. <laughs> so the richest source is heart. So dried heart tissue extract is a good source of cardiolipin. Now why would you give that? And the answer is if a person's got chronic energy production because they've got oxidation of their inner membrane, they may need to respond to cardiolipin. So when we've got a tired person, which is going to be you, 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 because we're all tired, unless you've got 100%, you will have a build-up of ADP as opposed to ATP, and most of you will be down in your ATP reduction in the mitochondria. Yeah, it's just a matter of how much, really, isn't it? And some of the reasons for that may be that you're deficient in CoQ10, you're deficient in cytochrome C, you've got oxidative damage to complexes 1, 2, 3, you know, the valves where all the stuff goes on, or to the whole membrane, the cardiolipid membrane of the inner membrane. So let's see what happens with people. Now, cardiolipin is very rich in 18,2 W6. Now, 18,2 W6 configures. Now, one of the first things about cardiolipin is it's different from what Jill described this morning of having two tails. This is like a tadpole with four tails. So it's got one head. It could possibly be two tadpoles that come together. Now, the, the phospholipids that Jill talked about this morning in the cell membranes have got two tails. So it's like a tadpole with two tails. And remember, normally, one tail is straight and the other one is kinked. And if it's got a kink, it means it's got an unsaturated double bond in there. But cardiolipin has four tails and double bonds. 
and most of them are 18.2. And that means 18.2, if you remember W6, okay, W6 means omega, it's a short form for Fermi. It means this is very rich in 18.2 W6, which is otherwise known as linoleic acid, which is on the other side of the chart that you've got on, that on your chart. So it's more the omega-6 side. Now people say, oh, the world is full of omega-6. People get 20 to 1 omega-6 to omega-3s. Very true, really, don't they? Um, what's it rich in? Um, sunflower, safflower, not really much in olive. It's in a lot of plant oils, isn't it, uh, the omega-6 there? Peanuts, hazelnuts, um, sesame seeds, and so on. And if people get too much omega-6 omega to omega-3, in theory. Now, remember what you briefly touched on, that if you heat any unsaturated oil above 100 degrees centigrade, the molecule will twist <coughs> right the way around. So the hydrogen on one side will go to the other side, and instead of having a kink, it'll straighten out. And because it's straight, it then has the physical chemical properties of a saturate, which means its melting point goes up. Okay? That makes the membrane stiffer. Okay, so if you've got trans fats, as they're called, in other words, you've lost the cis bond, your melting point's gone up, not down. You've lost your flexibility in the cell membranes. That means cell membrane to cell membrane won't unite and can't blend together in an efficient way. If your cell membrane has gone rancid because you've had the oil out with the top off, all right, or it's in a clear bottle, okay, how do you want to oxidize your oils fastest? Mm -hmm. Leave the top off the bottle, Keep the bottle by the cooker, all right, and let the light come in, ideally near a source of light or sunlight. So the way you protect your oil is you keep the top on the bottle, you have a Miron bottle which you pour your oil in, or better still, you buy your decent oil to begin with in there, and you keep it away from the cooker, ideally in the fridge. If it goes solid, then keep it somewhere cool, okay? So heat, light, and air are what oxidize oils inside and outside the body. Okay? So you don't want oxygen derivatives coming in and hitting because you'll go rancid. And if you go rancid, it changes the property of the cell membranes and again, they don't function properly. So when you think of the average person, do they get actually lipo, uh, linoleic acid in? <laughs> I doubt it. They get oxidized linoleic and they get trans linoleic. But how, when did you last have cold pressed organic raw oil? Now, most of you do take oils, I know, but the average person doesn't. They cook with them, okay, and they put them into their uh, food, and maybe what they turn around and say, well, yes, actually, I, what oil do you use? Oh, I have olive oil. Hmm. Now, you heard the story about Jill when she didn't have the organic olive oil, but olive oil is one of the most useless oils you could possibly have. It's all omega-9, it's all oleic acid. So it's not omega-6 very much, and certainly not omega-3. So it's not a particularly good oil, it's stable oil, it's monounsaturated, so you can cook with it, but the body doesn't really need omega-9, it can make those oils itself. So when did you last have an oil? Well, I use sunflower oil. What, for cooking? Oh yes. Okay. So if you find a, a person that has a, a lot of rancid oils in the body, they weaken to malarm the aldehyde, um, how do you find which is the good oil for them to get rid of the bad oils. Because you're changing the fats over all the time in the body. As they oxidize, you have to replace them. The body membranes don't know the difference between a cis and a trans. It doesn't matter. It doesn't take up the tail. It takes up the head of the phospholipid. It doesn't care whether that's a trans or not. So if that happens to be your brain phospholipids, it'll take up a trans DHA. It, you know, it doesn't know the difference. It doesn't get any less. But it will make your brain hard. The answer is ask the patient what oil they use and put them immediately onto an organic cold-pressed version of it. So if they use sunflower, the chances are they're oxidizing with sunflower oil. So put them on cold-pressed. We don't actually do it because it's not a very good oil to use in the first place. It's pretty neutral. We find that nobody strengthens the sunflower oil because there's nothing in there of any great value. But if they strengthen to, say, sesame or peanut oil, uh, maybe to olive oil, um, hemp seed oil, all these sort of things, Whatever they use, and if they are weakening to oils and they've gone around it, the answer is replace the one that they're doing with a good version of cold press and give them a spoonful of it. 
Coconut oil is all saturated, 90% saturated. It's 10% unsaturated. In my opinion, it's dreadful stuff to cook with. Lovely stuff to put on by as, an, as an alternative oil. But as soon as you cook with that, that 10% goes rancid immediately. It turns into a trans fat and it stinks. And it stinks the house out. If you cook with, with coconut, you'll smell it everywhere in your clothes and everywhere. It's terrible stuff. And it muscle tests a treat and they go <laughs> straight away to cooked coconut. Raw coconut's great. No, no problems at all with raw coconut. But if you cook with coconut and then muscle test it, you'll see a different story. Okay, so cardiolipin is largely linoleic, although it does have some omega-3, particularly DHA. So cardiolipin appears to be stimulated also, the production of cardio, by turmeric. And the reason we know that is when people strengthen cardiolipin, well, they tend to strengthen to turmeric. Now that might be because the cardiolipin is oxidized by free radicals, which are protected by turmeric. So the reason that the people with cardiolipin problems uh, are strengthened by turmeric may not be directly that it, it, it doesn't contain cardiolipin, but it may switch off the mechanism that damages the cardiolipin. So the inner membrane is called the Christi, is, is the, like the corrugations in there. One recent mathematical modeling study has suggested that the optical properties of Christi in filamentous mitochondria may affect the generation and propagation of light within the tissue. Oh, big deal. That's what we've been saying for a long time, if you've done any of the seminars. So this is now beginning to gain a lot of ground in orthodox neuroscience, that light may have a profound effect on the mitochondria. So energy equates with life and light. When ATP is made in the mitochondria, photons known as biophotons of low luminosity are emitted from the various cytochrome molecules. It is thought that such biophotons are carriers of information, a lot, lot greater than nerve information. And they now know that biophotons travel down the microtubules within the cell at a phenomenal speed. And that light will talk to the cells on the outside of the skin, uh, and that will go through the skin Okay, maybe one or two cells, maybe a little deeper sometimes than that, but that information will be transferred to the whole of the body. If you don't believe me, just put the coloured acetate on a person. As you know, when you put the coloured acetate on, and they weaken when you put it over the eyes, put it on the tummy, they weaken as well. How do they do that? In other words, that colour going into the person has a detrimental effect, that particular wavelength, and that information is spread from one cell to another to another instantly at the speed of light. Okay, so um, these biophotons should be of a broad spectrum or so-called white light. So in our opinion, the light that should be emitted from the person, this glow from it, should be of a very light the sunlight, it should be of a, a white light nature. Emissions of other non-monochromic uh, biophotons of specific wavelength indicate a, uh, a system out of homeostasis such as cytochrome P450 with carbon monoxide. Now the matrix is space enclosed inside the mitochondria that we said. It contains uh, a highly concentrated mixture of hundreds of enzymes, special mitochondrial ribosomes, transfer RNA, and several copies of the mitochondrial DNA genome. Of the enzymes, the major functions include oxidation of pyruvate and fatty acids and the citric acid cycle. So inside this matrix is a self-contained unit to generate the energy that we want. And it's all encoded in the DNA in the mitochondria itself. So they have their own genetic material. As I said, they encode for 37 total genes, which is interesting. And all those genes run the Krebs cycle, run the oxidative, make sure the membrane is restored, supplies the cytochrome uh, C enzymes, and uh, also the repair of, of complexes three and four. So let's go through there. So Let's put through that one. Two, yeah, there's two strands of that. Um, mitochondrial DNA is replicated by an enzyme called DNA polymerase. Now, DNA polymerase is a zinc-dependent enzyme. Okay. We learned that many, many years ago. That's the major cofactor, because it's zinc, to DNA polymerase. Okay. Mitochondrial DNA is replicated. That means the replication, the ability to produce another molecule DNA is by DNA polymerase. Um, now DNA polymerase can also repair, that's where we see DNA polymerase normally in the nucleus, is it repairs it when the DNA is damaged by oxidative phosphorylation, or, or by free radicals. 
So mitochondria is particularly susceptible to reactive oxygen species, or 3O, generated by the respiratory chain within itself. So this may lead to mutations in the mitochondrial DNA, which may alter the coding and the instructions of it. So here we see this circular, see this is the structure of the DNA. And this will lead to certain diseases like mitochondrial encephalomyopathy. We're hearing a lot about on the news on breakfast television at the moment, kids who've got mitochondrial dysfunction and how they're working with stem cells and so on to try and get these things back working again. So there's a lot of genetic diseases related to damage in the mitochondrial membrane. Remember, we've got um, hundreds if not thousands of mitochondria per cell, and we've got hundreds if not thousands of DNA within each mitochondria. Okay? So to mess up your mitochondria, to have drops in your energy level, you've got to do a good job. If you've got chronic fatigue, you've done a good job. <laughs> you must have damaged so much tissue. Unbelievable amount of damage. So you've got to be careful with these patients and start to pick them up gently. And the first thing you're going to do is to work on their DNA in their mitochondria because they've got mitochondria exhaustion or fatigue. And the only way you're going to stimulate that to get better is to stimulate DNA polymerase. If you don't get DNA polymerase, you can't have any repair going on. You can pile in the magnesiums, you can pile in the CoQ10s, everything you want. They don't get better. They come in carrier bags full of the stuff. All they need is the right type of zinc. And the right type of zinc is, if you like, a definitive type of zinc. And we found the best source here is vitamin C zinc, so zinc ascorbate. Vitamin C carries the zinc into the mitochondria. It's a transport molecule across the mitochondrial membrane. Zinc picolinate and zinc citrate, because citrate helps them with the citric acid cycle. So those three, or what we call smart zinc, are the best sources of zinc. When we come to muscle testing in a minute, with anybody with low DNA function, you'll see that those are the three best sources of zinc. So put together as a smart zinc compound, then they work better than anything else. So I find that 50% probably of my patients, regardless of what symptoms they come in with, have got mitochondrial exhaustion. Because remember, energy, life equate, therefore disease all equates with lack of energy. So we've got to sort of keep this in the back of our mind. This is a, a circular DNA. How do we get it repaired? How do we damage the DNA? Reactive oxygen species. Okay? Where do these reactive oxygen species come from? In the mitochondria. <laughs> Why do they occur in the mitochondria? Because we're deficient in the right nutrients to protect it, okay? Uh, and that's mainly the vitamin E, and of course the damage to the membranes. So let's have a look. So mutations can cause, uh, are, can be caused by reactive oxygen species there. Uh, the mitochondrial DNA accumulates genetic damage caused by free radicals. Um, and uh, I am here to heal your mitochondria. They are strong, healthy, and powerful, says the mitochondrial man. Okay, now, I want somebody who's got chronic fatigue or, or is tired. Okay, quick as a flash, you've had your turn. Okay, you have. Okay, how'd you come? Right. So what we're going to do is, what's your name? Judith. Judith is uh, tired, okay? So let's see if she's telling the truth or whether this is psychological. Okay, so what we're going to do is just do a simple muscle. Again, this is not how I would go about treating her in my clinic because I would start right at the very beginning. So pull, but I'm going to do it for demonstration purposes. So I need to get to a bit of tummy. Okay, so we need ADP. Magnesium ADP. This is the flat battery. Okay, so what we're going to do is put that on her and see how she likes another flat battery. And she's right. So her battery is flat. Okay. Now we've got to find a way now of getting her into um, a weakened state to find out what it is that she needs to strengthen, really, isn't it? So we could take her in any direction that we want. We could do it off a therapy localization if she's got any pain. With Alex, we did it off a, a, a skin problem there. We could do it with a, an eye position. We could do it with the colored acetates. There's 101 different ways of doing it. What we know is that when you move the eyes in an aerobic challenge, which would be left, right, left, right, about three or four times, like a Sakidi's rhythm, she'll go weak if she's got an aerobic problem, which she does, okay? So don't move, okay? You stay there. Now give me the ATP. 
So I just simply did an aerobic challenge with the eyes left, right, left, right, left, right to weaken that. Right? So providing she doesn't move, she'll stay in weakness now. So I'm going to put ATP, which is the energy bond, magnesium ATP, and she strengthens. So she is officially tired. She's right, she is tired. Okay? Now we go for pyruvate. So the next marker we're going to do is we're going to check her glycolysis. Can she even get started? And the answer is she doesn't strengthen to pyruvate. So we're clear on the first round. Anaerobic, she's straight through. Now we do acetyl-CoA. All right, follow on the charts with now. So acetyl-CoA means we're getting inside the mitochondrial membrane now. She doesn't strengthen to that. So her problem is inside the mitochondria. All right, see how we've done that. If she's strengthened to pyruvate or acetyl-CoA, it would mean it was somewhere back there. Now DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase means there's damage to the mitochondria in the, in the, uh, in the energy, in the mitochondria. mitochondria. She so strengthens the DNA polymerase. This means she can't regenerate the mitochondria, the DNA within the mitochondria. Okay, now we're going to have a look in the mitochondria. What's the mitochondria made of? These complexes. So let's go for complex. We're going to go CoQ10 first. Remember the pathway? When we had the electrons coming in, it's CoQ10 is the carrier of the hot potatoes. So let's do CoQ10. Okay. So CoQ10 would be a complete waste of time for her to take. Okay, now cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is the carrier molecule from complex 3 to complex 4. So cytochrome C. No. Now what we do is we'll put on complex 3 itself. <coughs> this is cytochrome C oxidase, um, cytochrome C oxi uh, oxidoreductase. <coughs> so it's complex 3 is okay, and then complex 4. So she strengthens to complex 4. This is where it all happens. Okay, everything happens at complex four, doesn't it? Remember in complex four, the four electrons come out there and they convert oxygen into water and molecular oxygen, okay? So this means she's got a high level of nuclear radiation going on. You know, she's got electrons there which aren't being got rid of, okay? And they're damaging complex four itself, all right? Let's have melondialdehyde for a joke. Okay, let's see what happens if she's going around to. Okay, and we also want to, or we we'll take now, we we'll do cardiolipin. So let's see what her cell membranes are like. Okay, so remember cardiolipin is the cell membrane, the inner membrane. So she strengthens to that. So what we know is that she's got probably oxidative damage to the cell membrane of her mitochondria, right? Which is actually destroying complex four in there. So we need to be able to switch off, obviously, the cause of this. And we need to improve probably her oxygenation and give her something to rebuild the membranes. Okay? So what we're going to do is, you, you just move your, follow my ass. Just shake it around a bit. Okay. So we're going to come back to you a bit later on because you're a good patient to look at. <laughs> but before you go, let's have a look at melondialdehyde just to cheer you up completely. <laughs> So she's going rancid. So let's try her with vitamin E, shall we? So we need the, the, the E, ideally the smart E, which contains the pistachio, the wheat germ. Yeah. Smart vitamin E, yes. That's the wheat germs, pistachio, and sesame, okay? So that she doesn't need. Hmm. Good. Okay, so let's have a look at some DNA. No, DHA. <laughs> okay. DHA. We know her membranes, we know her oils are going around because she's got melondiadehyde. That means she's oxidizing it. So we go for DHA. Why? Because that's the richest, um, mem richest one in the brain, which is what we're after today. So it could have been linoleic acid, but your um, DHA. So what do I do now? Thinking, hmm, she, uh, let's try her on fish oil. Give me an omega-3. Uh, how tall are you? Five, six and a half. So she's probably a red, isn't she? Mm -hmm. she, she probably, let's have a look at him. Oh yeah, that's a red hand, look at that. 
but long, thin fingers. That's definitely a red. Okay, so we'll go for fish oil. Do you take fish oil? Intermittently. Intermittently. It's a waste of time. <laughs> okay. okay, now we'll go, we'll say, right, fish oil's no good for her, so we'll go DPA. Let's see where the blockage is. Remember, we've got the malondialdehyde still on. So we, we're just talking about her rancid situation. So we, we know she's strengthened to DHA. Now she doesn't strengthen to DPA, the precursor to it. Right? That probably means if we leave the DPA on, she goes weak to that, which means she's got that blockage on the delta-4 desaturase. Okay? So the thing that will cure her there is the pumpkin seed oils, because it's got the delta uh, with the rapeseed. Now the rapeseed will supply the omega-3s with the alpha linoleic, but the pumpkin will open that last pathway up. So should we try on a bit of the... Uh, uh, oh, we've got lots there, yes. Malondardia. So we go back to the malondardia. Right? Just hold that. That was three teaspoons, I think. Good stuff. See, that strengthens nicely. Now that's probably largely getting oxidized now because it's been in the light, it's getting a bit hot here as well, uh, and it's certainly got the air. So I wouldn't give that, you know, when, um, when you come to drink that later on, Alex, don't drink that one, okay? Because that one has probably gone rancid by then. Oils will go rancid, that's one of the reasons why we put vitamin E into that, um, to protect it, because it's in an oil bottle, so it's a culinary oil, and, but we put extra vitamin E in there to act as an antioxidant. But E will only last a certain length of time in an oil if you leave it out in the light and the heat and the air, you see. But this is why E is extracted from oils and because E is there to protect the oil from going rancid. Okay? And but as it goes rancid, in other words, every oxygen molecule, a reactive oxygen species that hits the E, the E absorbs it and becomes a free radical. So at the end, rancid oil is a double whammy. Not only is it hard, different chemical constituent, but it's full of oxidized or reactive oxygen species of the E. The E itself is a free radical. Why? Because there's nothing to take it from the E. So this is why if you add extra E in, the shelf life of an oil will last much, much longer, providing you look after it. Keep it in the Miron bottle, keep it in the fridge or somewhere cool, and keep the top on. Okay? If you want to be really careful, put a drop of water on the top as well. Okay? The drop of water will float and seal it over from the oxygen. Put too much water and the water will drop to the bottom. But if you put one drop on, it'll seal it over quite nicely. Good routine to get into, particularly with such a good oil as that uh, smart thinking oil. Right? But we don't know that's really the answer to you, but we're just guessing at the moment. But so far where we've got, you can't go too far wrong by increasing your DHA production. But what I really want to do with her is find out why, what the fundamental cause or the problem is that's creating the damage to your membranes in the first place. Okay? So that could be anything that creates an inflammatory or free radical response which if you remember on the chart, could be normal oxidative procedures, uh, oxidative reactions. It could be um, that we've got an infection with a respiratory burst. It could be we've got toxins, or most likely we've got hypoxia, lack of oxygen. Okay, any of those four will generate free radicals in the mitochondria, which will damage the mitochondria itself. So you're a little bit like a nuclear power station going up. <laughs> and that's what we've got to stop, because once we can put the blotting paper on there, that's fine, we'll have you back a bit later on. Okay, so let's make sure this is so fundamental that you understand this, okay? And because with those tools, you're going to be very accurate, okay? Now, she may do a holding job by taking antioxidants. It'd be probably a good idea for her perhaps to take turmeric. That could be a good antioxidant as well. Um, there's lots of things you could do, but we've got to think a little bit more carefully as practitioners and say, She's generating free radicals. Why is she generating free radicals or inflammation? And the answer is those, one of those four things that generates them. Normal oxidative procedures, toxins, uh, reactive oxygen species caused by infections, so they're out of control, or hypoxia, or all of those. So we need a system of testing all those in relationship to her health, which of course we do in a minute through our meridian system and going through the eye positions to find out exactly what the cause is. So the two big causes of most health problems is going to be low ATP, or low energy, and low oxygen. That's the double whammy. If you've got low oxygen and low ATP, you're done, aren't you? You can't get yourself going at all. 
because you haven't got the, the air into the furnace with the oxygen and you haven't got the fuel in there to begin with. Okay? So you've got a double whammy there. Now we're going to have a, a boost in that. So let's have a look. And just before we go for coffee, and you'll probably deserve a coffee after this, <laughs> because you've got the tools now, because you've got those being given or uh, are available now with the complex of the complex three, four, cytochrome C's and so on. So let's have a look here at a few other pictures. So this is inside the mitochondria. So that will be inside the matrix. This is the inner membrane. This is the outer membrane. Let's remember that the inner membrane is mostly made of cardiolipin. The outer membrane is a mixture of different fatty acids. Um, and if these, we get leakage of free radicals here, either in back into the mitochondria or out, they can cause a lot of damage. So complex one is simply an entrance into the membrane for NADH, or the H part of NAD. So we've got a hydrogen going in there. Okay? Remember, hydrogen is the simplest molecule. It has one proton and one electron. So when it goes through the complex, like the gate, one proton will go into here in the membrane, and the electron will be caught by CoQ10, as it will in complex two with FADH2. Uh, so we have two electrons going here, two here. That makes four altogether. That's then carried from complex three to complex four by cytochrome C. And then those four electrons are pumped out altogether. So in one foul swoop, oxygen will be reduced to water as a clean machine. Right? But if it's pumped out univalently for any reason, we get four reactions. So we get superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radical, and water. Why do we want it uni univalently? Because if we want to fight infections to kill bacteria, viruses, etc., we want to make selective reactive oxygen species. Okay, so that's where we got to. So the build up of the protons will get to such a concentration, they'll pump out through complex five, they'll come out that way, and activate an enzyme called ATPase, which puts the phosphate group back on ADP to make ATP. So that's the magic of where we make the, air, make the, oxygen, make the air energy. But this is where the oxygen is that we burn. And this is the Krebs cycle, or citric acid cycle, which is necessary in order to make the, the hydrogens on FAD and NAD. So complex one is called NADH dehydrogenase. That's the one where ubiquinone, or CoQ10, goes from. So I don't want to get stuck down with these. You can reuse these. These can all potentially leak free radicals. We know that pesticides do a lot of destruction to mitochondria. That's not good news when you see what most people do. Um, you know, I was introduced um, some months ago to the magic bullet, or the, the Nutri bullet. Have you really got one of those? Uh, yeah, 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 it's fantastic things, okay? Uh, wonderful, and with the book that comes with it, it tells you you must use organic fruit and veg. And of course, you can't always get everything organic, can you? So you still put it in thinking, oh, I've washed it, you know. So. And then you really go off color after a few days and think, what on earth's happened? And of course, what you're doing is you're taking concentrated pesticides in, okay? Because you're having more of this, so you're having seven fruit and veg in one go, you know, it's fantastic, all that. But you're getting seven fruit and veg, or how many, of pesticides at the same time. So this is why don't use the nutri bullet unless you do use organic, because you're concentrating pesticides, and you'll increase that, which will do harm to your mitochondria. Uh, uh, specifically, you know, dichlorovos and other organophosphates. So these can damage complex one and two. Complex two is part, actually, of the Krebs cycle. It's succinate dehydrogenase, where FADH2 comes in. So we're skipping, uh, number three is cytochrome C oxidoreductase. Um, and you see here the cytochrome B, which forms the complex three, contains two heme molecules. And the cytochrome C contains one heme. So we've got another heme. So with complex three, four, and cytochrome C, they're all heme-derived molecules. So you can see why heme is such an important substance to understand how do we make heme. Why is it important? Because it goes on to make hemoglobin and those other molecules, those other enzymes, that get rid of free radicals. Uh, so let's whip through that. Complex four is known as cytochrome C oxidase. is a large protein. Uh, it receives an electron from each of the four cytochrome C molecules. Uh, it itself is made of uh, cytochrome. The complex contains two hemes, 
Uh, cytochrome C oxidase is encoded by the mitochondrial DNA. Cyanide, sulfide, azide, and carbon monoxide all bind to cytochrome C oxidase. That's complex four. <coughs> thus competitively inhibiting the protein from functioning, which results in chemical asphyxiation. Methanol converts into formic acid, also inhibits the same oxidase system. Do you remember what Jill was saying about formic acid? Do you remember this morning when you use formic acid as a test? Um, against rancid oils, right? Remember, I think you told them, you put the um, formic acid on to make sure people don't weaken to the formic acid to begin with. Um, take that off, put the bottle of oil on them, and they don't weaken. Then put the formic acid and the bottle and see what happens. If they go weak, that oil's rancid, okay? If you take rancid oil, what's gonna happen here? It's going to inhibit cytochrome C oxidase, complex four. Your energy level will go down, okay? That's what happened to poor Jill, why she couldn't walk. What was the symptoms again? You had pain in the heel. Yeah, that's all signs of inflammation, isn't it? All because she went for the cheap option, which wasn't in fact the cheap option, no. It was actually more expensive, that was the joke. It was a lovely Italian one or something, wasn't it? Be looked beautiful with the label, no? Quite expensive oil, uh, but it wasn't a good oil. It wasn't the organic one and uh, uh, gone rancid or whatever. Um, as I said to Carl, um, if you haven't got formic acid handy, just get hold of some red ants. Okay, that's what. <laughs> okay, so put the bottle of oil with some red ants. If they weaken to it, you know that's the formic acid. So always, con always carry a few red ants around there. Okay. Um, the complex for cytochrome C oxidase is protected and stimulated also by vitamin E. So in the therapeutics, in, um, which I've been learning about as far as the light, light beyond the visible spectrum does contain, of course, light, but we can't see it. Okay? In the same way that down at the ultraviolet, when we go below 380, uh, we can't see it anymore, it's ultraviolet. But some people can. Okay? Some people can see a little bit more. They see violet lights, which we don't. And a lot of people get this when they've had cataract operations. They have a cataract and they say, I can see better in colors that I've never seen before, or haven't for years and years and years. And when they do monochromic tests, in other words, uh, beams of light at uh, single nanometers of light, some people can see it. And then they know that, oh, they're right, they are actually seeing something which we don't. Most of us cut out about 385, something like that, and when we go into that violet, it then goes black. But some people can see a little bit more. Now, on the other end, it's interesting, because at 645, it, when red starts, right up to 770, enormous wave band, is red. And it's only red. It doesn't change at all. Red, 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 red. Just like Diana's top, it doesn't change at all, you know, it's the same one, okay? Whereas in blue, we've got about almost, uh, you know, 100 or so nanometers, 120 nanometers, and every one is slightly different, sli slightly different shades of blue. It's only when you look them up close and you think, oh yeah, they're not quite the same. But red is red, 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 red. And when we go out uh, 770, maybe as high as 800, we go into the infrared. And what they found is if we could see infrared, we would see heat. Now, you can see infrared with special goggles. You know, night soldiers wear these to pick up heat spots. You don't see colors, you see heat coming out. And that's how an owl knows where the bird is, where the mouse is in the field at night time, swoops down, grabs it, and that's it, the mouse is finished. How does it know there's a mouse in there? Because the mouse urinates regularly and drops one drop of urine, which gives off the heat. <laughs> and the heat-seating missile of the owl comes zoom, straight down and gets it, because it can see in the infrared. Now what they found is that cytochrome C oxidase, which is complex four, where everything happens, the big sort of nuclear reactor part, the important part of that, is sensitive to 660, which is mid-range red, uh, 830, and 840. And this is 660. So handheld lasers are always set to 660. So you can use these uh, to actually stimulate. And lasers will penetrate, even soft lasers like this, will, will, will penetrate several centimeters into the skin. Okay? So don't be fooled if you put something over the skin, it doesn't go in. Okay? People say, well, it's only on the skin, there's no sensitive. And we used to think there's no sensitive vi li eyes or anything in your skin, are there? Why do you go weak when you put that on there? Don't be silly, it goes straight into the heme. You've got so much blood in there, and you tell people it takes 16 seconds for the blood to go from here to here and back. 16 seconds, that's fast, isn't it, okay? So how much blood do you think goes around your umbilicus? 
You know, that's where all your energy went in there. There's lots of blood vessels around, and they're pumping blood around. And what's blood full of? Heme, which is sensitive to light. Okay? That's why you take the baby who's got heme problems with jaundice outside in the light, and it cures them. And it's the red light that cures them. Okay? Not the ultraviolet, this is the red light that does it. So you can put a baby out in the freezing cold as long as it's red, as long as it's bright. Okay? It doesn't have to have ultraviolet. So interesting, even lowers of 660 will be therapeutic in the red zone uh, to people with cytochrome C oxidase. The first thing you can do with somebody who's got fatigue problems, you know, is put them outside, put them in the sunlight. People start to feel better. It's called heliotherapy. The Greeks and the Romans made it compulsory that every house had to be built with like a solarium in it where the sun could come in because they knew the power of it. And then that was lost. Okay, then it no longer was in in instigated. So light is very, very important which means that we shouldn't be in this room a moment longer. We should go and have a cup of tea now and take it outside while the light is still around. Okay.